Hello. Will the exam <laughs> focus on material covered in the Arctic Concepts Physiology Unit and nothing from previous units? Okay, so why don't you go and take a look at um, the course link announcement. That's all we know for now. It will be Arctic focused. But remember, we're not just talking about physiology in the Arctic unit. We're bringing it all together with evolution and ecology. It was an onion. An onion layered. Yeah. Good. And it made you cry. It made me cry. It made me cry. I cry all the time with onions. I get Smith to cut onions because sometimes he wears contact lenses. Yeah. He just has a steely, steely... <laughs> <laughs> No onion's going to get the better of me. <laughs> no, no, it's the contact it's lenses. It's literally the contact lenses. <laughs> okay. Um, we are going to tell you two, I think, really cool stories. Um, and they're related and they're entirely the opposite in a bunch of ways. So it's kind of neat. I hope you enjoy it. We'll get started here with the presentation mode. <clears throat> are we doing... I'm going to do closed captioning. Nice. Hello, testing. There we go. Okay. Yay. We're going to tell you two stories um, and they are unified in that they are two stories about two very cool species. One of them is obviously cool, woolly mammoth. The other one I hope you will think is cool by the end. Um, and the other thing that's connected is that we're going to talk about hemoglobin or not hemoglobin, but it's about hemoglobin. <laughs> um, and we'll tell you about the evolution of uh, the hemoglobin molecule in two different scenarios that have gone in two different directions. Um, this is what we hope to accomplish by the end of this lecture. And these are our two very cool species. So the first one is quite obviously cool because it's a woolly mammoth and that's amazing. The other one is called an ice fish, um, and it may not seem to be very cool, but hopefully by the end of the story, we will we will tell you. Now, remember, the idea is that both of these stories are going to be about hemoglobin. It's covered by the bar. Oh, yeah. I see that. Um, why is it covered by the bar? How do I, how do, I do that? I forget. Try it again. Thank you for mentioning that about the closed captioning. Um, there we go. I, there we go. I, I don't know if I've got it. Oh boy. Okay. We'll give it a try. So basically the stories are about hemoglobin, but they are kind of exactly opposite. I haven't figured it out. Why is it doing that? If you click on the test break, you draw it. There we go. Oh, ha, look at nice. me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so both of them about hemoglobin, very different stories, both about evolution. Okay, so Smith is going to start with woolly mammoths, and I'll pick up with ice fish. This question on the course link about where to find these YouTube extravaganzas uh, once you're up or once they're loaded. And that was actually a thing I was going to talk about at the start. Some of you went online and looked for Monday's lecture right away. And you may have been given messages from the YouTube that we were infringing on copyright. And we were. We didn't think about that. So we showed two videos on Monday from the BBC and from the CBC the David Tennant, the doctor, 10th Doctor Who, narrating the predation or attempted predation of the polar bear upon the seal, and from the BBC and Rick Mercer's visit to Algonquin Park and the hibernating little tiny black bears. Um, both of those are copyrighted. And so we can show them, we show them to you, but when we uploaded our lecture, it contained them or uh, the YouTube knew that it did. So it took a little while for us to edit them out and then have the powers that be at the tube of you reevaluate the copyright infringing status of our video. It is not copyright infringing any longer. So you can go there and see it. Now where on your course link can you find it? Well that's easy. You go to the same place that the lectures are. So go to course link, go to the nav bar and look for discussions and open that. And then inside of that you'll see class slides and then open that. And then look on that page and you'll see that date 
then click on that, and then you'll see a PDF or PDF. <laughs> And you can look at the slides there, and then you'll see an embedded video on the tube of you, and that'll be us swearing. Yes, we have to we have to make sure that we swear a little bit so that nobody steals our stuff. Because <laughs> you know that's how <laughs> that's how we get around it. <laughs> that's why Ocean's Eleven doesn't have swearing. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Andy Garcia's character uh, swears in Ocean's Eleven. Yeah. So we're going to start out with mammoths. We talked a little bit about mammoths last time, only in that there was a slide of mammoths and we mentioned something about Ice Age. And you mentioned that we had destroyed your somebody's childhood because we said that Ice Age uh, contained things that weren't true. We're going to expand on that and tell you some other things about mammoths that we know. One of them is that they don't sound like Ray Romano. But we're going to tell you about some amazing evolutionary adaptations that they do possess beyond not sounding like Ray Romano or Queen Latifah, where they have amazing adaptations to living in an Arctic environment. And they're amazing because they're kind of convergent with many other Arctic animals, which we're not going to get into too much, but you can file that away for life in general, but also because of where they started, which was uh, as a tropical species or a tropical taxon, their ancestral taxon. So we're looking at a phylogeny here. This Think about this when, you, when you're asking the question in your head of how much of the exam, for example, is only going to be physiology. We've said it's going to be in the context of the Arctic, but remember in every single thing we've talked about, we've, for example, shown phylogenies. We've talked about phylo phylogenies. We've used the word clade. We're going to use it again later today. So this is a clade of elephants going back nearly 40 million years to the proto-paleomastodon. One of the neat things that you're going to, uh, I think, already see from this is if you look from left to right, you're going from older on the left to uh, more recent and extant animals on the right-hand side. First thing in that today strip is that it's artificially wide, right? Like today is a very short period of time. In fact, now it's over, and now it's the future, and now it's the future again. So, so It's also the only box that's getting bigger. Boom. Whoa. <laughs> so it's both too big and too small, but growing. <laughs> One of the other mind blowing things, I think that if you like elephants and probably many or all of you do, uh, that if you haven't heard the news already, uh, the good news about elephants is that while they are endangered, uh, there are more species of elephants than probably your parents thought there were, or you may have been taught that there were. There's multiple species of African elephant. There are African elephants that live in forested areas, and there's African elephants that live in plains areas. And that's something that um, DNA uh, has helped us learn only in the last kind of five to 10 years. So what is this phylogeny talking about here with regard to elephants, extant elephants in the green? and recently extinct elephantoid things like mammoths. Well, if you look above that Asian elephant here, you'll see a lineage called Mammothus, which is a genus of mammoth. Um, you can say mammoth, you can say mammothus. It depends how frozen your tongue is after your next visit to the dentist. <laughs> They're pretty recently diverged. If you look at where uh, the Asian elephant most recently shared a common ancestor with the mammoths, you can see it's only about four and a bit million years ago. That's uh, relatively recent, um, but also take, keep, take a look at the fact that depending on how well you've been schooled in hairy elephantoids, that mammoths up at the top here and mastodons and stegodons are super deeply, uh, distantly related. Though the, ma the mastodon and the stegodon branched off of the paleomastodon lineage, the ancestral elephantoid, a long time ago, more than 24, 25 million years ago. And so to be a hairy elephant was a successful thing that multiple lineages that weren't very closely related uh, took advantage of. So our contemporary lineages here, the Asian and the African elephant lineages are tropical. The mammoth, which we're going to focus on today, was not. This was, uh, it grew out of, you'll see in the next slide, out of Africa and Asia, just um, like many of the, the kind of radiation uh, diagrams that we showed you when we were talking about human evolution. You can see this tracks more or less the same um, directions, but just at very different time periods. 
Um, but these Arctic lineages, this Arctic lineage or the Arctic adapted uh, mammoth lineage has a bunch of different um, functional traits compared to its other more extant Asian and elephant tropical relatives. Some of them are external and they're easy to see. Uh, they have this dense, dense, dense woolly coat. They have much smaller ears uh, than the tropical ones do because heat retention is a problem in the Arctic as opposed to getting rid of heat, which is what large ears help you with in the tropics. We can see in North America we had three different species, or we believe we had three different species, Primate genus, Trognatheri, and Columbi. And we did overlap. Our, the human species and the mammoth species clearly did overlap. So and we know this from, uh, from phylogenetic estimates, but literally from, the, from reading the writing on the wall and looking at these cave paintings um, maybe 10, only like a second ago in terms of evolutionary time of 10,000 years ago, where we see uh, different human populations narrating stories of hunts and daily life, uh, the internet of the time drawing these cave paintings and narrating what species they shared the planet with. These are, if you ever have a chance, once the world returns to, uh, to normal or some semblance of normal and you can travel again, go to Europe and find some of these cave paintings and share some space with them. It's pretty moving. It's lovely. That's homework. Now, we don't share space with them any longer. That's because we are here and they are not. Now, why are woolly mammoths extinct? One of the reasons we think is because we are here, because we're a pretty good predator and they must have been pretty tasty, or they certainly were a lot of tasty meats all at once. And once we had figured out how to hunt them, we became very good at it. That's one hypothesis. The other, or there's say four, but the other kind of leading one is, is a change in climate. Um, this lecture or these kind of thoughts today aren't really about why they're extinct. Um, it's going to draw on that extinction, but um, you, there's lots of room for reading and, and figuring and thinking more about that if you're interested in this book to us. These are some intersection of climate change and, and, and human activity is the likely kind of tied co-first uh, reasons as to why we no longer share the planet with mammoths. Now, we can still find mammoths, and we're not finding fossilized mammoths, we're finding mammoths frozen mammoths, and we're doing that um, to a degree because of climate change, because as the permafrost in Arctic North America and Arctic Asia and, and Russia are melting, large fluvial rivers are eroding these areas and exposing out of the riverbank trunks and feet and knees and wrists and ears of adult mammoths, and as you're seeing there in the slide, baby or juvenile mammoths. Um, and so we're learning a lot about the biology uh, just because we have literal specimens to look at. And as an aside, if you're on the Twitter box uh, and looking for other people to follow, there's a scientist in Maine uh, named Jacqueline Gill who's worth following for a bunch of reasons, for communicating science, for advocacy, for uh, women in STEM, and also for deep historical paleoecology, where she travels to these Arctic regions and works with people to extract um, an understanding of the biology of the steppe or of the tundra uh, 10,000, 40,000, 60,000 years ago. And we've seen her give talks where she's shown video of literal uh, riverbanks in Siberia last summer where there is a trunk or the knee or the foot, the paw, I want to call it, of a, of, a, of, a, of a baby mammoth kind of poking out at it. And it gives you a real visceral sense of the living organism in a way maybe that looking at a preserved Silurian brachiopod that you'll find in the rocks around Guelph doesn't necessarily give you the same emotional context. Been, part of that is just physicalness, that it's the Silurian brachiopod is a shape in a rock. It's a rock. The mammoth emerging out of the riverbank, that was the mammoth. So as soon as we begin to discover these things, um, and, and this has been happening, I, I mentioned climate change, but this has been happening since, um, I mean, Victorians would travel around and, and extract uh, a, a colonial cost across the world. And one of them was they would come back with mammoths and go, ta-da, aren't we great? Thank goodness for coal and doff their, doff their hat. 
But as soon as um, some stoners like Kerry Mullis figured out the polymerase chain reaction and we were able to not or able to look directly at DNA instead of indirectly uh, at it, people have been thinking about how we can extract DNA from extinct organisms, the dodo, the passenger pigeon, and mammoths, large megafauna. And so that process in your lifetime has changed dramatically from where we were able to just say, yes, we've crossed the boundary and we can get DNA out of a mammoth to say, okay, now we can get one larger fragment of a gene to now we can get multiple genes to now we can get entire genomes. And that's a stepping off point to asking a whole bunch of different questions, one of which we'll talk to about today in a kind of a Michael Crichton Jurassic Parky kind of a way, there's still lots of people out there thinking, well, now we can build a mammoth. All right, why would you want to do that? But it's a different question. And maybe you'll live long enough to see that. We won't. I won't. Um, I'm much younger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I definitely won't. <laughs> I may not make it to the end of today's class. Um, <laughs> In the context of today though, the resurrection of the mammoth, what being able to amplify and sequence the entire genome of this mammoth lets us do is to look at the functional physiology of an extinct animal. So instead of just looking at the thickness of the coat or the size of the ears relative to the body and make some adaptive hypotheses about how that those were adaptations to living in an Arctic environment, we can now look at physiological adaptations and we're going to walk you through uh, a quick story about how some scientists have done that. This is a bit of a recipe for it so you can write this down if this is what you want to do once you're out of your physical distancing socially connected contemporary world. So you need to first get mammoth DNA so mammoth bone mammoth tissue from Siberian permafrost is how they did it in this case and then you need to know what a gene sequence looks like for an elephantoid hemoglobin in this case. So an oxygen, the oxygen carrying molecule, oxygen carrying protein. So you isolate that gene from the full mammoth genome that you've extracted from the permafrost preserved mammoth. Then you take the gene for the specific thing, function that you're looking for, in this case, the hemoglobin, and you insert that gene into a plasmid, which is a tiny bit of circular DNA. I stumbled over that word at 1030, circular, circ Euler, red leather, yellow leather, <laughs> in a plasmid. And all it does is kind of replicate, and as the, the bacteria grows exponentially, the plasmid uh, produces that product um, that, that the gene codes for. In this case, your bacteria then builds you the protein of the extinct elephant, which is kind of amazing. And the scientist you're gonna see in a second, Kevin Campbell from the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, who did this, keeps using the word resurrection, um which uh, it, it's, it's gonna, amazing it's let's not, say it's amazing but it's not going to cause like a major chapter in a religious group mm, i bet you what's the internet the rule 32 <laughs> 34 34 so we not like know. that but for, <laughs> for something like um yeah maybe there are people out there who really like worshiping at the feet of mammoth hemoglobin uh -huh. i digress the next critical thing that he has to do, uh, that, that, that you would have to do as a researcher, is do the same thing uh, and express the hemoglobin for extant elephants from the tropics, Asian or African elephants. We're going to show you a bit of a video uh, that Kevin Campbell from the uh, University of Manitoba in Winnipeg who is the lead author on the study that we'll keep unpacking in a second here. And I'm going to, it's 15 minutes. We'll post the, the link later on on course link, um, but you can have a, a read here. I, before I start the video and jump into the minute or two clip that I want to have him describe to you the, the coolness of what it is that he found, I want you to raise your right hand and promise that when you become a famous scientist and you do the scientific communication and the interviews associated with your famous science, don't wear a t-shirt that says legend because it. it looks like you're talking about yeah, yourself. Yeah. Or if you do do it, have an arrow pointing to your co-author. Because when it picks up oxygen in the Tell me about you, how you... So, 
Kevin Campbell and his 10 or nine different co-authors from around the world, essentially the story that they're unpacking there, that I started unpacking, you know, that we did and that, that he then continued, was this story here that they, in amplifying and, and growing mammoth hemoglobin in a bacterial culture, what they were able to do was to look at and compare the extinct hemoglobin of the Arctic adapted woolly mammoth to the tropical adapted extant elephant lineages. And what he found, he just described, was that there were three specific amino acid changes in the mammoth hemoglobin that meant it was much more um, tolerant uh, at, at releasing oxygen at cold temperatures. And it meant that the up and down metabolic cost that Kevin was just describing, it didn't have to go through. This is kind of an amazing thing. So thinking about the flow um, fun function flowing from structure, but thinking about how as a scientist, you interact with the question, the hypothesis, the proposed mechanism and the prediction, how you would, what you would expect to see in your graph or your figure to see if your hypothesis was supported. We lay that out essentially here. So the hypothesis they had was that wool woolly mammoth hemoglobin had properties that would allow it to function in cold extremities and, and appendages despite having a warmer core temperature. And what they predicted would bet be that the hemoglobin structure would be more similar to that of extant Arctic animals than it would be to closely related tropical elephants. So essentially proposing, remember back in the first, in the evolution story where we talked about convergent evolution, this is essentially an expression in our physiology unit of looking for uh, convergent evolution of hemoglobin. And they did it. Here's a picture that describes, or a kind of a flow chart that describes how they, what they were doing uh, that I just described. So they extracted the DNA, they translated to mRNA, they made the protein, and then they measured the ability of that reconstructed hemoglobin, the, the resurrected mammoth hemoglobin, to bind over a wide temperature range. And what they found was that the woolly mammoth hemoglobin could indeed get rid, unload the oxygen to the tissue, to the muscle more efficiently in cold conditions than the hemoglobin from living element, elephants, <laughs> which is kind of amazing. Uh, I, this, is an, this is a fantastic story and it's a, you can file it in your mental file cabinet as, as one that sits firmly in the evolution by a natural selection, a constrictive or a, um, an adaptive, no, a harsh environment like the Arctic, cold, meaning that there is a solution, there's a good way of doing things and a bad way of doing things, and the one, the elements of the population that had a better way of dealing with that harsh environment reproduced more successfully, more frequently, more numerously, and that passed on. And that's all happened within the last kind of uh, this entire story of, of successful adaptation to an Arctic environment, uh, hemoglobin that can unload oxygen at low temperatures, and then extinction uh, via us and or a changing climate has all happened in the last kind of four million years. And now we've got another amazing Arctic story. Okay. So... Just to recap, <laughs> that was a story. Let me sum up. Let me sum up. Um, that was a story about the evolution of an adaptation in the context of environmental constraint. That's the word. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, what that means is the environment was presenting a challenge and that essentially selected for all of the organisms that had adaptations to be able to get through it, right? Um, and so that's kind of, that's how natural selection works, right? It has to happen in the context of environmental constraint. If there's no constraint, then there's no real reason for selection, right? Okay. Generally, there are wonderful exceptions, but let's just go with that. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell you basically an opposite story. Um, again, related to the environment, but in this case, the environment is going to be a facilitator. Um, yes. So here's the story. Ice fish, they're a thing. They exist. And they're amazing. 
Um, here's what they look like when they're teeny tiny, they're kind of see-through. Um, and then uh, as they mature and they get older, they kind of look like a milky white kind of creamy color. Um, and they are that way for a particular reason. And the reason is because the ice fish don't have hemoglobin. They do not have red blood cells, essentially. And that's kind of freaky um, because it's kind of like a standard in biology for things that have circulatory systems and, and spines, right? Those things have red blood cells. Um, and, uh, this fish doesn't. And so that was basically, yeah, like basically the start of a whole bunch of research into all of this. But let me tell you a little bit about the, it was, the, it was the WTF moment. It was the WTF moment for scientists. Oh, quite a little while ago now, yeah. but, so but yeah, an important moment. Um, let me tell you a little bit about their natural history. Um, this is going to be on the exam. <laughs> you will see this slide um, and then you will see this question. So let's go through it. <laughs> so this will tell you basically most of what you need to know uh, in order to understand this story. So it's background. It's not going to tell you about um, the thing that I'm going to tell you about afterwards. So this is kind of the background stuff related to the ice fish. Um, so people are worried about the fate of the ice fish because it is called, um, it is referred to as a stenothermal Arctic, Antarctic fish. So not Arctic as in, in the North, but in the South, okay? Uh, stenothermal basically means that it has a very narrow range of temperatures that it can survive in. And anything outside of that range, it's gonna die, right? So it says here, animals evolved to live in narrow ranges of cold temperature. Um, this study is going to be focusing on the Antarctic fish, um, a group, the Nodothinoidae, that dominate the Antarctic waters, right? There, there aren't that many species. Diversity is fairly low. Um, again, you know, supporting our original kind of global pattern of high diversity at the equator, low diversity at the poles. Um, but they dominate, so the populations are, you know, fairly big in size. Uh, they evolved in the Southern Ocean, which means that they're endemic to the Antarctic a while ago, 20 million years ago, which is a long time. Much longer than the mammoth story. Yeah. Um, and they have unique adaptations to the cold. So they have evolved. Natural selection has selected for unique adaptations to be able to, to survive. Things like antifreeze proteins, for example, right, would be a unique adaptation that evolved through natural selection in the cold. Um, they, uh, have, um, over a micro evolutionary scale. So over a short, relatively short time frame, they have shallow genetic variation, shallow or low genetic variation, um, that has been attributed to fluctuations in population size. So that should be, um, kind of spike, spiking up a little flag for genetic bottleneck, for example, where we have this major reduction in population that reduces the genetic variation. And that's what these scientists are saying, um, that the low variation that they see in the genetic, uh, the, the genes of uh, these populations is due to former or past bottlenecks that reduced it, okay? Um, they also talk about low population connectivity, uh, which means that there's not a lot of immigration and emigration across different populations of uh, these species. That should trigger some ideas related to gene flow. So there's not a lot of gene flow going on, which means that there are barriers to gene flow, uh, which means that there are potentials then for speciation. Um, they may have um, low potential to adapt to global warming as a result of this shallow variation. Um, and so there's quite a bit of concern about their future. That's what that article says so far, right? That abstract. So here's your clicker question. Which of the following statements is false about the ice fish? So A, they have experienced long-term natural selection to survive the intense cold. Yes, they have all of these adaptations to living in the cold. They appear to have experienced bottlenecks in the past. Yes, when we talk about major fluctuations in population size, that's what that means. They show evidence of limited gene flow among populations. Yes, that's what we mean by low population connectivity. 
They can survive over a broad range of cold temperatures, but are unlikely to survive warm temperatures. No, they cannot survive over a broad range of cold temperatures. They can survive in a narrow range of cold temperatures. That's what stenothermal means. So D is false. And finally, E, they are unlikely to adapt easily to warmer temperatures, but it is unknown how well they may be able to acclimatize. And this is true. So there you go. The answer is D, and you'll see it sometime in your very near future, like in two weeks. Okay, let's take a look at the fundamental niche of the ice fish. So if we remember, fundamental niche means uh, that basically the organism can live there, that the abiotic conditions are hospitable to life and survival of, of a species. Um, and if we take a look at the narrow ranges of temperature um, that exist uh, around the world, these areas in red in particular, but also in yellow, are able to support an ice fish. The thing is, there are no ice fish in the north. They are only in the south. And so we could start to ask, why aren't they there? Remember from our ecology unit, we were asking those questions. Why is something not where it isn't. <laughs> so wait, we've done phylogenies and fundamental and realized niche while talking about physiology. Amazing, because it's all connected. Okay, so why aren't there any ice fish in the north? And the answer is because they never got there. Because in order to get there, you would have to cross a whole bunch of really warm temperatures that would not allow it, right? Yeah, no good for the ice fish. It would die. Belly up along the equator would be this like raft of dead <laughs> ice fish, right? As they tried to, as they Dr. tried to Jacobs, swim. Dr. Jacobs, you paint a picture. I paint a picture. Not cool. So they stay in the south. Um, if somebody decided to go and like harvest a bunch of them and bring them up there, why? Why, why would you do that? Um, technically, they could survive, but they can't get there. So that's why they're not there. So let's take a look at the current distribution. On the very top here, the current distribution is around the Antarctic, right? Okay. And um, everything looks good here at the South Shetland Islands and a few other, the Orkneys and South Georgia is here and all of that stuff. The ice fish are there. They're doing well. In the context of climate change, though, the prediction isn't very good. So if we go down here, down to the estimated um, distribution in the year 2100, we can see the yellow represents areas that are predicted to have major population declines or another bottleneck. Um, and here, these areas are predicted to warm to the point of not being able to support ice fish anymore. Now, let's take a look at their evolutionary history because it is pretty cool. So here we've got a phylogeny of a bunch of funny looking fish, okay? And within that phylogeny is a clade of Antarctic funny looking fish. Clade, clade. okay? Um, and what we can see is that before the, the common ancestor of the Antarctic clade or the Antarctic funny looking fish, uh, we can see uh, that they evolved uh, the antifreeze proteins. So they appear before the common ancestor of the funny looking fish that are in the Antarctic. So that facilitated, that allowed them to, you know, move on into um, colder and colder waters, right? Okay, let's move along. Um, here we have the secondary loss of the antifreeze proteins. So this group doesn't have them anymore, but they used to, but for some reason they survive maybe because the water is a little bit warmer where these guys are. It could be. Um, moving along, we get a, a branching off here, some skinny, funny looking ones, some ones with some big fins, also funny looking. And then we get to a very recent common ancestor where one branch in one of the, one of the common ancestors of only that branch, we have this hemoglobin loss complete and total loss of hemoglobin. And that's a big deal. 
And it was a big deal for people like in medical research, for example, who were working on um, technology associated with putting people on bypass while they were operating or people that had blood disorders um, or even lung disorders, right? Related to oxygenating their blood. How do you get oxygen to your muscles if you don't have a carrier molecule like hemoglobin? So people got really excited because they were looking at this particular phylogeny going, oh my goodness, there's an adaptation here through natural selection uh, in order to be able to deal with like the cold, right? And so people were making all sorts of different connections, trying to figure out why and how it evolved. And it turns out though, that we were really wrong. It turns out that it's not an adaptation. That what happened was these fish, had a mutation that knocked out the, the genetic code for hemoglobin. But because they were living in such a cold environment, they were like, eh, look, I'm still alive. And the reason why they were still alive is because cold water can contain a lot of dissolved oxygen compared to warm water. So if you think about um, when you put water on the stove to boil, you put cold water in a pot on top of the stove. And then as it starts to heat up, the molecules of the water start to get excited. So when the water is cold, they're kind of super lazy. If my the tips of my fingers are the molecules, they're kind of super lazy. They're just hanging out. They're not really bouncing off of each other. They're, there's a lot of space in between the different molecules for dissolved stuff. As you increase the temperature, as you're heating up your pot of water on the stove, the molecules get really excited and they start to bounce off of each other and they start to push out things like dissolved gases, okay? And that's why you get bubbles that release dissolved gases that are in there and in the form of gas, right? So you have all sorts of oxygen as well as other gases that are released, right? But for the purposes of, you know, the biological system, the, the important molecule is oxygen. So as you heat up water, it can contain or it can hold less oxygen. Really cold water can contain a lot of dissolved oxygen. And so um, when these fish experience this mutation to knock out hemoglobin, they still lived, which is freaky, right? Because it is a maladaptive trait that evolved because of environmental facilitation, because the environment was super stable um, and had a lot of oxygen. So no hemoglobin, and we have evidence of this quite clearly in the bottom right-hand corner here of the slide, because on the left-hand side, this vial here that is translucent, that's the blood of ice fish compared to the blood of a regular fish right, where we see lots and lots of red blood cells evidence, right? Here, it's just basically plasma. Um, so no red blood cells, the hemoglobin gene has been lost, and that's the non-adaptive part. Now, when that happened in the history of the species of the ice fish, subsequent adaptations to that maladaptive trait evolved. So Ice fish, for example, have very high blood volume. So they have a lot of blood that's going through their bodies, right? Which is bringing the dissolved oxygen that comes in directly through their, their gills um, and gets circulated, but doesn't have that carrier molecule, right? Large blood vessels in order to facilitate that high volume, costly circulation, it's expensive, that's less efficient, um, and they've got really big hearts compared uh, to normal fish. See, they have really big hearts. So on the left-hand side is the heart of an ice fish. So no myoglobin, no red blood cells. There are some fish that do have myoglobin in their heart, uh, but no red blood cells circulating uh, around their body. And this is what their hearts look like. And then this is kind of a normal fish heart. So it's smaller for pumping less volume. Um, and it's more red because there's obviously there's red blood cells there. So this is a story essentially of when bad things happen to really good fish. Um, it's the story like completely the opposite of the mammoth, right? Where the adaptation to the hemoglobin evolved in the context of environmental constraint, where there was a limitation, it's selected for the adaptation that would increase reproduction and all of that stuff related to natural selection. 
this is not that story with the ice fish. The ice fish had this mutation that was maladaptive that in all other scenarios should not have been perpetuated in the population, right? Those fish should not have been able to reproduce and pass on their genes. But because the environment was so stable um, and so rich in oxygen, it actually facilitated the evolution of this particular trait through genetic drift. But there's a problem. The problem is what will happen if the water becomes warmer? So imagine today's Arctic tundra full of woolly mammoths. How amazing would that be, first of all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but imagine, imagine woolly mammoths on today's tundra and imagine they're super well adapted to their environment. Imagine what might happen if the temperature rises by a couple of degrees, say three degrees Celsius. The answer is probably not that much, right? It may change its vegetation over time. Like there may be some significant problems over time, but the mammoth, the individual mammoth itself is probably going to be fine, right? In terms of its physiology, in terms of its hemoglobin's ability to offload oxygen. Even though it's super well adapted to a couple of temperature degrees below, it's probably going to equally be able to offload um, with a little bit more temperature outside, especially because it's an endotherm and it's maintaining an internal temperature, all of that stuff, right? But the ice fish is more or less screwed if the temperature rises by a couple of degrees Celsius. And that's because of the oxygen um, solubility changes as you increase the temperature. And so the whole environment is going to destabilize for the ice fish where this maladaptive trait evolved in the context of it being super stable and super rich in oxygen now we increase the temperature by a couple of degrees and they go belly up like almost immediately okay so it becomes really less resilient um in you know to change uh if something evolves in the context of environmental facilitation so that's our story about the two different uh, species related to hemoglobin. And what we'd like you to do is uh, take a look at this table and try to fill it out just to make sure that you understand um, super well. We'll probably be having quite a few questions based on this. So what you can do is you can maybe replay this lecture, go through it and fill it out. I think we've hit on pretty much absolutely everything here. Like all of the answers are in this lecture. You should be able to do it. Um, Fish and, on, uh, mammoth off. Yeah. Fish on, <laughs> mammoth off. Uh, you should be able to do it quite easily. Uh, I think we've I think we've hit on everything. It's um, actually mammoth on, fish off. That's kind of the that's story. That's kind of the story. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we hope you enjoyed it. And uh, it's been really fun. Thank you. It Today is Wednesday so we all have day. all day we have two more lectures next Monday and next Wednesday um, and uh, then I don't know what we're gonna do I think we're gonna go mad because <laughs> they really keep us grounded we get really ex maybe too excited for these lectures um, it's kind of our way of, of feeling a little bit connected um, we hope that um, everybody is well um, and uh, that you're all safe and healthy we are all safe and healthy um, and uh, and doing quite well and quite thankful to be where we are um, and also very grateful to have the opportunity to help uh, and support uh, and advocate on behalf of, of students in higher education. It's been um, it's been really great and kind of keeping our brains active, which is which is awesome, especially when you're old. <laughs> I'm younger, a lot younger. <laughs> Okay. Take care, everyone. Take have, care of uh, each other. Yeah. Have an awesome week and weekend. And we really look forward to seeing you again on Monday. Go wash your hands. Wash your hands. <laughs>